Hello, you are listening to the Natural Healing Show for UK Health Radio. I'm your host, Catherine Kerrigan, medical intuitive healer and Amazon number one bestselling author. You can find out more about me and my work at KatherineKerrigan.com and UnlimitedEnergyNow.com. While you're there, definitely sign up for my newsletter so you can learn even more about how you can heal yourself naturally. Now, I'm so excited about our guest today, who is Fred, oh, Fred Donaldson. Oh, Fred Donaldson is an author and founder of Original Play. His two books include Playing by Heart and Playing for Real. And you can find out more about O. Fred Donaldson and his life-changing work at his website, originalplay.eu. Welcome, Fred Donaldson. Welcome. Thank you, Catherine. It's wonderful to be with you. So I have to tell for our audience how I first heard about Fred Donaldson. So years and years ago, I actually started in healing work by learning something called brain gym, which is just simple little exercises that anybody can do to get your brain working better. And I remember being on the way to the brain gym convention in Victoria, Canada. And I remember being on a little boat going to the Victoria candidate and hearing about this guy who was a play therapist. And I remember rolling my eyes and thinking, now there's a therapist for everything. And then I have to say for our audience that Fred Donaldson still to this day is the most profound speaker I have ever heard in my entire life. And I remember listening to Fred Donaldson and something he said and the way he said it and the stories he said just brought tears to my eyes. And I remember I started crying. I was so embarrassed. I was just crying with everything, the profundity of what he was saying. And I remember leaving and then I was like, you're missing what he's saying. You have to go back. So my hope is that um, everyone gets a lot out of what we have to hear from Fred Donaldson today. So Fred Donaldson, will you start for our audience and tell us how you developed this work? Because your life story is fascinating. Well, actually, I didn't want to start it. I didn't. I had no intention of doing this. Um, I had been a university professor and had been fired from my my jobs and took a year uh, in Southern California to just surf and finish writing a, uh, a black studies book. And at the end of the year, I got to a point where I needed a job again. And a friend said, Fred, I know this really nice school uh, why don't you go and see if you could get a job there? And I thought, no, nah, I don't have any experience with kids. I don't know anything about kids. That's not what I'm trained to do. He just said, well, go ahead anyway. So I did and met with the director. He gave me a job as a um, assistant to teachers, but it didn't work out. Um, I didn't pay enough attention to what I was supposed to do. So he called me in and said, Fred, we like you, but the assistant job is not working out. What can you do? And I looked at him like, I don't know. I don't have any idea what I can do. Because I've never been with kids. And all of a sudden, I said, I will be a special teacher in play and exploration. <laughs> and he said, okay, do that. <laughs> well, that sounded really good. So I left and spent the weekend thinking, what in the heck am I going to do? <laughs> I don't know what that means. Why did I say that? Well, come Monday morning, I had to do something. So I showed up and not knowing what to do, I just sat on the floor. Um, in one of the classrooms of young kids from three to five years old. 
Fortunately, they knew what I was supposed to do. And they climbed all over me, like, like they knew exactly why I was there. And I thought, wow, what is this? I don't understand this. Um, but it kept, it kept going every day. I would show up for five to six hours and kids would play with me. And being a, a university professor for so many years, I have, was really curious about patterns. And I noticed patterns in the kids' play. And I thought, wow, I, I didn't know there was patterns in children's play. I thought it was random behavior. Well, it wasn't. The first two patterns I noticed were really simple, easy to see and understand. And that was how they use their eyes and stages of touch. Mm. And I thought, okay, that's understandable. It was the, the next patterns, three and four, that were much more difficult to understand. The third pattern was that their play had no contest behavior in it. And that was surprising to me. I thought all play was contest. My play as I grew up was contest behavior. That, so my assumption didn't fit with these kids. And the fourth uh, pattern was even harder to understand. And that that was somehow these kids played with a sense of grace. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even know what the word meant. And so I just kept playing with more and more kids. And this was in Southern California. So uh, I went to Mexico and played there with kids and played in many different kinds of schools in the United States. And I noticed that they all played the same. And I thought, wow, how can that be? What do they know? Um, and nothing made any difference. Culture didn't make any difference. Uh, medical problems, issues didn't make any difference. Gender didn't make any difference. So I thought, hmm, okay. If this is a, a pattern, maybe all kids know this. And what if that's true? And I thought, wow, that's a pattern that's bigger than I imagined. And it, it wasn't cultural. So it didn't make any difference what culture the kids were from. And over a number of years, I decided that, well, if so many kids know this, what if the pattern is bigger than kids? What if it's animals too? I didn't know what to do about that because I wasn't an animal person. Um, so I didn't know what to do. I called George Schaller at the New York Zoological Society and I told him what I wanted to do. I wanted to play with wild animals. Where should I go? And he said, Fred, you're born too late. The world's been carved up by scientists and they're not going to want you rummaging around in their research areas. Mm. So I let that go. Living in San Diego, I called a friend at SeaWorld. Oh, I'll play with dolphins. No, you have the wrong PhD. You can't do that. So I just let it go. I wasn't getting anywhere. And I visited a friend in Seattle and she was going to see some wolves at a reserve and she said, you wanna come? Yeah, I've never seen a wolf. So I was there and I was looking at them and I asked the biologist if I could go in and play with them. And he laughed and said, of course not. <laughs> People don't do that. These aren't pets. Um, and I said, mm, okay. Um, he said, but if you write a proposal, I'll take it to the board and we'll see what we do. They accepted my proposal and with the provisions that I couldn't hurt a wolf and whatever happened to me was my own problem, which was perfect. I spent years playing with the wolves and they played just like the kids. 
same stages of touch, same eye contact, the same sense of no contest behavior in play. Wow, that didn't make any sense. So I, I thought, well, maybe it, it's bigger than wolves and kids because a pattern that ends with wolves and kids doesn't make any sense. So I, from there, I went to playing with dolphins in Australia and then that ended up in Montana playing with grizzly bears and black bears and elk and all kinds of animals. And I realized this play that the kids began to teach me years ago was not cultural, it was not even species. This was a gift from creation. This is creation's way of allowing us to feel connected to all life. Not as just a, a theory or an idea, but a, as a practical, tangible experience. And I thought, wow, that's, that's incredibly different from what I expected. Um, I had no idea that I had stepped into something well beyond my expectations or my learning. And my understanding is you've also gone on to play with gang members. Yes. Um, it occurred to me at the be very beginning, I was playing with really gentle kids. And eventually I started to play with kids that weren't so gentle. And I thought, well, I don't know about this. Um, how do I handle this stuff? And I had to learn how to move. I didn't know how to move. And I had to learn how to you handle my emotions when I was hurt, if I'm punched, kicked, bitten, and so on. So I had to learn essentially how to give love at the point of attack mm -hmm. is the way I described it. Mm -hmm. It didn't do any good to be able to give love an hour later after I calmed down. I had to give it while the punch was happening. Mm -hmm. And that I learned from a, a seven-year-old. He was brought to my, the school I worked at when he was four. He had been severely abused, forced to live with uh, family dogs in the doghouse, ate out of the dog dishes. When he came to school, he didn't know how to talk. And he could just barely stand up. He was so aggressive that staff didn't want him to be part of their daily routines. So they said, just give him to Fred. Fred will take care of him. I spent seven years with him, literally with him every day. And one day I was taking him, he was living in a institution for children and he didn't want to go home. He wanted to stay, but I was carrying him and he got angry at me. Um, and when he got angry, he bit. So he bit right through my face, right through my cheek, all the way through. And as soon as he bit, there was an incredible sense of pain. And then I just gave him love right through my cheek. Mm. And I don't know how he did that because I had never done that before, but it happened. And as soon as I gave him love, the bite stopped. And I held him, took him on the bus, and he went home. When I went into the school, I was bleeding and crying at the same time. And the, the teachers were used to seeing blood on me, but they weren't used to seeing me cry. And I realized when I sat down that Danny had taught me an incredible lesson. And that was how to give love at the point of attack. Mm. As soon as I loved him, the attack was gone. And I thought to myself, wow, I knew Mother Teresa could do that. Jesus, the Dalai Lama, Nelson Mandela, but not me not a regular person. And I thought, wait, Fred, what do you think all this is about? 
This is about the grace of being ordinary. Mm. And I couldn't believe that in the only way he could, Danny taught me how to handle violence, about the letting go of fear, the letting go of my ideas, the letting go of the physicalness. So by the time I went to gang members who were all much older than Danny, I had a sense of that I was asking them something very important. I was asking them to let go of all the categories they thought were important, like the name of the gang, the clothes they wore, the guns they carried, everything. But I didn't ask them verbally to do that. In, in one case, I was asked by a teacher in East LA to come to play with eight 13 year old gang members that she had, but she didn't know what to do with. So I, I showed up and put some pictures of me playing with wolves on the floor and didn't talk to them. And they said, well, hey, that's you playing with the dogs. And I said, those aren't dogs, those are wolves. And they said, no, no, wolves eat you. And then they said, well, how do you do that? And I said, come here with me. So I took them outside on the lawn and without talking to them, I started to nudge them. I got down on all fours and started to push and nudge. And before long, they jumped on me and started to play. So here I'm playing with these eight 13 year old gang members on the lawn in front of the school. And I did this for three hours every Friday for 10 weeks. In the second week, the teacher called me and said, Fred, I need to tell you that one of the gang members, Jose, called me up and he was, he was in school. And I, I said, what are you doing there? You don't normally go to school, you just hang out. And he said, well, I listened to what Fred said about wolves and playing. And I realized I didn't need to get into a contest with my teacher. He didn't blame the teacher, didn't blame anybody. He just stayed in class. So with that fascinating, I'm, and I'm, not, I'm already on the edge of my seat. And let's take a break now for to listen to a message from one of our commercial sponsors. Hang in there with us and we will be right back. So O. Fred Donaldson, from this very profound personal experience, and I just love your story because you were this PhD in geography who went to play on the playground. What is original play? Can you share with, for our audience, what is this profound work you have created? The most important thing to understand about original play is that it's a gift from creation or God or Allah or great spirit, whatever term one wants to call it. It's not an artifact of a culture. My, it's not, I didn't invent it. It's like gravity. It's here. We can participate in it, but we don't create it. If one doesn't understand that, then much of what happens in a rich play will be on will be beyond understanding. So why is original play important in a school? Because it helps everyone in school, both children and adults, let go of the categories that we usually live with in school. And letting go of those categories allow us to feel a sense of belonging to everybody. It allows us to have a, a tangible, practical way to deal with the issue of bullying, which adults don't seem to know how to deal with. 
Um, and it's clear to me in both individual cases and in school settings that I can use original play to diffuse bullying and create a, a relationship among a bully victims and bystanders so that those categories disappear. Once they disappear, what happens is that children have three important senses of safety, intellectual, emotional, and physical. And without those, school can be a scary place for a child. And it, it provides a sense of safe touch that doesn't depend on knowing categories. Most touch we use as human beings, and certainly in a school, is based on cultural rituals of who can touch who, doing what, how, and so on. Original play allows us a way to communicate loving, safe touch to anyone because it, it means that I touch the person based on their needs, not my needs. Most of the time we touch, we touch based on our own needs. We don't have the skill to be able to figure out or identify the needs of the being, animal or human who we touch. Original play reverses that. Now, so, now fundamentally, Gregory, it's an issue of safety. Now, Gregory Bateson said, or asked a question, what pattern connects the crab to the lobster and the orchid to the primrose and all four to me? Do you think there is a pattern that connects all life? Yes, I, I wanted to, I met him once and I wanted to run up and hug him and say, yeah, I know the answer to your question. Um, and I think it's the reason that people like Jesus, Buddha, Gandhi, Mother Teresa, uh, Robert Oppenheimer, they all said to us that children have something important to give us. They have important gifts. And what more important gift can there be than they have a way to show us how to connect to all life on earth that doesn't require knowledge about the nature of that species or culture. So the touch I use with a human infant is not different from the touch I use when I play with a beluga whale or a grizzly bear or a gang member. It's all the same touch because the point of that touch is loving to communicate a sense of belonging and safety, regardless of who you touch. Now, Fred Donaldson, if someone were to observe you doing your work with original play, what would it look like? Could you describe that for our audience? <laughs> yeah, it would, would look, most of the time it would look like, if you can imagine a group of puppies or kittens rolling around with each other on the floor. <laughs> that's mostly what it looks like. Although that's not all. There are periods of stillness, like you would find with a, a young child sitting in the lap of their grandmother or grandfather, mm. just listening to them, just holding, just hugging, not seemingly doing much of anything. That was very common with the wolves, that they would come and just sit in my lap, and that would be it. Mm. No movement, no rambunctious, it's nothing. No. Yeah. As you are aware, in the US, there's just been a horrible, devastating problem of school shootings. And Krishnamurti asked, is it possible for a human being living psychologically in any society to clear violence from himself inwardly? If it is the very process, will, will it produce a different way of living in the world? Is it possible, do you think, for us to find and live in the way that Krishna Murti is looking for? Yes, now I would say yes. Before I started to play with kids, I would have said no. Um, I couldn't imagine it. 
Now, it's not only I can imagine it, I've lived it. That been in situations where my life depended upon being able to find a response that was not based on fear or in self-defense. That's a huge step for human beings. We haven't figured out how to not be afraid, how to not engage in conflict and war. We think that conflict and war and fear are normal, natural, and necessary for us. And once we believe that, it's very difficult to find an option because all of our options are based on those thoughts and we're stuck. With all of our technological process, we are still stuck. And we simply do not know what to do, whether it's adults and kids in the school in Texas, whether it's the world in Ukraine, whether it's small scale or large scale, we simply don't know what to do. Original play gives us an option because it's totally outside of our cultural frame of dealing with the world. It's not just another way of self-defense. In fact, in order to play, I have to give up defending myself. Mm. If I defend myself, that would mean to the other person or being that I don't feel safe. If I don't feel safe, then they don't feel safe. And when we're not safe, we don't trust and we're constantly looking for a way to be superior. But original play makes it obsolete. Now, my understanding, Fred Donaldson, is that scientists have studied your brain and you don't go into the fight or flight response. Can you share for our audience a little bit more about that? Like how playing has changed your brain? Well, a psychiatrist in Sweden said to me one day, Fred, you played so long that you've changed your brain. Your brain does not go into fear the way a normal brain would do in a crisis situation. In that moment between stimulus and response, you don't go into a fear response. You go into a loving response that occurs prior to fear. So fear never happens, both neither emotionally nor physically. And what happens because of that is that a field, I'll call it a field, an environment is created that allows another being to enter and feel safe. And so the issue is, is resolved. Now, it's important to understand that from my perspective, I don't create this. I'm a partner in it. And a partner in a, a field of energy that includes me, another being, an animal, a person, persons, and God. And that comes from a person who, before I started, I wasn't even aware of the use of God. I, didn't mean anything to me. But I realized I've been in situations where my safety depended upon a response that I was incapable of, that I was absolutely unprepared for. And the only answer I could come up with, and I've written to scientists around the world asking them to tell me scientifically, what happened to me in this situation? And they can't do it. Now with that, let's take another break from one of our commercial sponsors and listen to a message and hang in there. And we'll be right back to hear more about how play can help you get out of fear.
Do I have a minute to run open a door? Not right now, sorry. Okay, okay so Fred Donaldson. So can you give our, uh, an example for our audience how you mentioned that there were situations where maybe your life was actually in danger, but you went, used play to be safe. Right. I was walking down the, in the street in my neighborhood in California, and a Doberman came out of the uh, a house and just rushed, attacked me from the street. Just I didn't have any any warning. Just came right at me and jumped at my head. But about mm, a foot in front of me, he hit like an invisible wall and fell on the ground. I have no idea what happened, but he circled me and came around again from back, he around my back and back to the front and he jumped again at my face and he hit an invisible wall and fell down. And he just sat there snarling at me until an owner came out of the house grabbed him by the neck and took him back in the house. And I have no idea technically what happened. I just stood very calmly, didn't move, just watched. And I felt no sense of fear, no sense of danger at all in it. Now, Fred Donaldson, what is original about original play? The fact that it's, its origin is creation. In the Western world, it was Sophia who played before God in Proverbs. In the Hindu world, it was Leela, Lila who played to set up the energy of the universe. This is the same play. It's the play that is the energy that moves through the entire universe and each one of us. And I give it the word love and grace, but the language, the words that are, are used are not important. What's important is the feeling. Are fear and conflict necessary? Einstein had a question for Freud. Is it possible to control man's mental evolution so as to make him secure against the psychosis of hate and destructiveness. Do we have a choice? Yes, we have a choice. I don't believe that fear and self-defense are necessary. And when we have a, a choice of love in those particular situations, we have more options and with, with which to respond to a given situation. And it's the ability to access options that are important in, in any situation, whether it's life, life defense or not. And it's clear to me that a loving brain is a more powerful source of options in a stress situation than a fearful brain. So yeah, to, to Einstein, we have a choice. Uh, we just never understood how to get to that choice. Now, adults like to say that practice make perfect, makes perfect, but children don't practice playing. Their their perfection needs no practice. Why is that? Why is it that children just know how to play? The same way that we know, if I asked you, do you practice taking a bath? <laughs> I just do it. Of course, it's what we do, and they do it 100%. It's heartfelt. It's not 50%. They don't think about what they're gonna do and do it. They just do it. We tend to think about when we play and our play has 
an incredible range of cultural meanings. It can mean entertainment, it can be winning and losing, it can be money, it can be prestige, and can even be killing. But it's, it's thought through as a cultural process with young children. It just is the way they interact with the world, how they learn and how they touch the world. You don't need practice for them. Now, Einstein said, if at first an idea is not absurd, then there is no hope for it. What absurd idea will give humanity hope? And what absurd idea will give humanity hope? The safety of the world depends upon child's play. That's a pretty absurd idea. But the reality of that has been hinted by many scientists and sages. And the reason that it's true is that child's play gives us access to energy and information that when we feel afraid, we don't access. So we're, we're limiting our vision of what's possible in the world. And Child's play opens that up. Elie Wiesel called children bearers of promise. Mm. And I think of the promise as peace, but we can only achieve that peace through loving, not fear. And we seem to think that the only way to achieve peace is to have another war. an option. Well, children provide that option. And that's a serious found for human beings that up till now, never in the history of human beings accepted as possible. That's big news. Now, children and animals have shown you through your years of play, Fred Donaldson, that you're part of something larger than yourself. What is this something and why is it important? I think of the, the something as grace or love. Um, not my love. It's not something I create. It's something I participate in. And to realize that when I participate in grace, that sense of oneness, that philosophers and physicists and other scientists like to talk about is not a mere idea or romantic notion. It's tangible reality and it's felt and it can be shared. Uh, I was working at a Head Start Center in Southern California and a teacher, out, I was in lunch outside and a teacher ran out and said, Fred, Fred, we need you in a hurry, um, there's a hummingbird caught in the room and we, we tried everything and we can't get it out, you do it. <laughs> As I went to the room, I said to myself, I don't know how to get a hummingbird out of the room. What am I supposed to do? I had no idea. I stepped inside the door and raised my hand up. As soon as my hand was up, the bird was in my hand. <laughs> There was no time difference between my hand going up and the bird being in my hand. I walked to the door and loose. And the teacher said, oh man, you're really good. <laughs> and it wasn't that I was good. It was that this energy, grace, love, whatever we want to call it, was felt by the hummingbird. The hummingbird felt that the only safe place in their room was my hand. And that's the feel. It can be small, it can be large. And the idea of us as human beings is to create a field of compassion, big earth. So we all move around and everyone else's feel compassion. That's grace. Now, if play is built into the very fabric of the universe, 
Can we really play with all life on earth? That's what I'm trying to do. That's one of my goals. I want to play with all life on earth. I haven't gotten there yet. I think um, I counted, I've played with 30 to 35 different kinds of animals around the world. Um, so there are a lot more <laughs> left to do. And I leave that for lots of other people to carry on. Now, hunting, culling, poaching, and, and hands off define a consciousness of separation, greed, and destruction. How can we, we reimagine and re embody our relationship with animals? Well, first, it, and the process came to me by first re embodying it. I never imagined myself playing with animals or even kids. I used my body first. The message came through my body first that this is possible. And then I started to think, wow, if I can do this, maybe I can do that. So it was a kind of going back and forth between tangible embodied experience of love, of grace, of safety, blended with imaginings that it could be bigger than what I know. And then, it, wow, it just got so that, wow, this could be the way the whole world works. Whoa, amazing. And why shouldn't it be? I mean, it, it just makes sense to me that the world should be a place we should be safe in. Now, Einstein said that no problem can be solved with the same consciousness that created it. Where is such a new consciousness to come from? That's what humans have never figured out. We keep trying to create peace with the same thoughts and consciousness that created war. And the fact that it's never worked doesn't bother us. We keep developing think tanks designed for peace based on the idea of what do we do about war? What children and animals have shown me is we don't have to deal with fear and war at all. What we have to do, this is much harder. We have to learn to love. Because once you have a loving brain, your brain cannot be fearful at the same time. So the idea is, and what kids actually did with me was create a default brain, body, mind system based on that default system, fear never shows up. So you create just, you just create safety. Now, how do we embody one mind? By starting with kids, young kids, I think they're the best teachers. We can have an idea of what one mind means, but it doesn't mean a lot unless you embody it, unless you can live it with your body and communicate it to other beings, both animal and human and plant. So that the one mind is a living, body, not an idea. Now, I understand that a child once asked you to tell him a story in which no one dies. Can we tell our children such a story, especially now, again, going back to, you know, what's happening in the schools where so many children don't feel safe in school? That's right. For yeah. lots of reasons. They don't. I told her, I'm not gonna tell you a story. I'm gonna show you a story. So what I did was actually play with her. And when it was done, she could feel, oh, wow, nothing gets better than this. And, and that's the ability to feel that there's a different option in, Seattle once I played at a, a school for special needs kids and an eight-year-old boy with autism 
played with me when it was time for his teacher to pick him up to go back to the classroom. He said to me, I wish I had another life. I wish I had another life. This play is my reminder of another life. That's what I mean by feeling and stepping out of the categories that we think are impossible to get out of. He stepped out of autism, something that most scientists say he can't do, but he did. We can step out of the categories like fear, like cancer, gangs, all of it, and create sanctuaries for each other. It takes uh, time, it takes practice, it takes commitment and heart. And it takes being able to say, what's the most important thing that happens in a child's day at school? It's not learning mathematics. It's being feeling that I'm loved and safe. Mm -hmm. And if that's the most important thing that happens in a child's day at school, what do we do to create that? The most powerful way we have as adults, as teachers, as janitors, as principals, of helping that to happen is safe, loving touch. But we don't do it. We're afraid of it. So what we do is teach children fear and wonder why they're afraid. It comes from us. So Fred Donaldson, founder of Original Play, any final thoughts for our audience? Yeah, approach the, the uh, ask yourself, each of us ask ourselves every day, all the time, how am I touching the world? How am I allowing the world to touch me? And is loving safety the basis, the source of my touch? Thank you so much for your life work. You've been listening to The Natural Healing Show for UK Health Radio. I'm your host, Katherine Kerrigan, medical intuitive healer, Amazon number one bestselling author. You can find out more about me and my work at katherinekerrigan.com and unlimitedenergynow.com. We've been listening to O. Fred Donaldson, the founder of Original Play. You can find out more about Fred Donaldson and his life-changing work at his website, originalplay.eu. And remember, when you learn how to play and you practice playing and you play in your life, you heal yourself naturally because you get out of fear and step into love, the most powerful healing force in the universe. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time.